Okay, I think I will get um, the ball rolling and I'm sure more people um, will join us. Uh, so to begin with, um, welcome everyone. Before I start uh, with anything else, I want to acknowledge that today I'm zooming in um, from the um, uh, from the lands of the Warrigal and Gambri people, uh, Naragal and Gambri people, excuse me. And I want to uh, acknowledge uh, that sovereignty over these lands has never been lawfully ceded. And I want to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, as well as to any indigenous people who might be joining us today in this call. Uh, it is today an absolute pleasure to be joined by two fantastic scholars. Our um, invitee for today is uh, Professor Machangai Selev, who is the Nathan Pat Professor of Law at the University of Maryland School of Law. And she teaches and researches in the areas of global public health law, public international law, international human rights law, transitional justice, and criminal law. Before joining Maryland, uh, the University of Maryland, um, she was an associate professor at the University of Pittsburgh. And um, before that, she was at the University of Baltimore School of Law. Her work quite appropriately and a very long time before it became fashionable, focuses on the disproportionate um, racialized effects um, of uh, contagious diseases and international law. And her work has appeared in some leading um, law reviews, including the Cardozo Law Review, the Columbia Law Review, which is where today's piece was published, Texas Law Review, and the UCLA Law Review. And on top of that, um, she writes very often for online fora, including Just Security and Opinion Juris, and she's also an editor uh, of Just Security. And today, Machangai will be kind enough to talk um, to us about her um, newly published piece, uh, Disposable Lives, COVID-19 Vaccines and the Uprising. And as is the structure of this uh, webinar series, she will do so in conversation with one of our colleagues here at the ANU College of Law, Associate Professor um, Wayne Morgan. Um, Wayne is an Associate Professor, as I said, here at the ANU College of Law, where he's also the Associate Dean um, for Education. His work is in heavily interdisciplinary, focusing on questions of social justice and legal reform, especially in the areas of sexuality, gender identity, and their legal uh, regulation. And uh, Wayne's work is recognized internationally as pioneering in the fields of queer legal theory, but it is also work that has direct and concrete, concrete excuse me, influence um, on practice. So his work has been used and has been influential for leading uh, test cases on questions of sexuality and sexual identity here in Australia, in front of the High Court of Australia, but also internationally in front of the UN Human Rights Committee. And his work also, and this is why I think um, it would be amazing to have these two scholars in conversation, focuses amongst other things um, on uh, HIV, AIDS regulation and the law. So um, as the structure of this webinar series goes, our invitee, uh, Professor Silif, will talk for anywhere between 25 and 35 minutes to be followed uh, by a commentary and Q&A session um, by Associate Professor uh, Morgan. And hopefully this will leave us with 10, maybe 15 minutes uh, for questions from the audience. To accelerate the process, it would be really helpful if you have any questions as the discussion involves, throw them either in the Q&A box or in the chat, and I'm going to read them out loud um, when the time comes. On that note, uh, Professor Selev, we are delighted to have you here. The floor is yours. Well, thank you so much for that uh, very kind uh, introduction and for this invitation. And uh, you know, under different circumstances, we would be doing this in person, uh, but uh, COVID-19 has upended 
our world completely. And so we're meeting uh, remotely and I am sadly missing out on a visit to Australia. Uh, but <laughs> besides my desire to come to Australia, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be in conversation with you and with Professor uh, Morgan on a topic that I think is just really important and pressing uh, today. And um, I think that COVID has shown a mirror on um, underlying fissures within the international order. And so what I would like to do uh, is to connect how the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed long um, underlying problems in our international order um, and has exacerbated global health inequities in ways that I uh, argue further subordination. Uh, and I think that these fissures have, have, have sort of deepened along the lines of the center and the periphery. Uh, and this dynamic reflects um, structural violence that exists within the international order. Um, and we can see the ways in which global health inequities uh, and the role of law uh, and different institutions and policies have facilitated differential risk for infection um, in the global south um, and among those already infected for adverse consequences, uh, including death, injury, and illness. And so I want to use my uh, latest uh, piece, Disposable Lives, COVID-19 and the Uprising, to connect how racialized notions regarding which lives are disposable are reflected widely uh, in the international order um, and connect that to the expendability uh, or presumed expendability with which Black lives in particular um, are treated. Uh, and in the piece, I go into more detail on how uh, this is uh, emblematic from systematic, systemic uh, police violence um, to the devastating uh, racially disproportionate impact of COVID to historic and ongoing uh, medical experimentation uh, and inequitable vaccine access. And so what we've seen with COVID is the pandemic of systemic racism and COVID-19, the twin pandemics, uh, have sort of heightened the visibility of the disposability, or at least the presumed disposability with which society views the lives of people of color. And this, the cumulative effect of that is the devaluation of, of subordinated groups. And so for our time today, I would like to focus my remarks on exploring the theme of disposability or presumed disposability um, and focusing on uh, the issue of inequitable vaccine access, um, because I think it's one of the defining uh, issues of our time. And so I, I actually don't even want to use the phrase inequitable vaccine access, because I feel like it's a euphemism. And so I prefer to use the term vaccine apartheid that has been developed by commentators to uh, capture really the stark uh, racial inequities that are at play with uh, attaining access to, to vaccines. And so instead of using the language of sort of vaccine hesitancy, which is, is, is quite common um, in, in some analyses, I would like to turn attention to both systemic and secondary barriers um, as the root causes for the um, vaccine apartheid that we see uh, taking place uh, domestically where I'm situated uh, in the United States, um, but also globally. So first I will focus um, just briefly on the domestic picture in the United States, um, which is one uh, that is replicated in some sense when you um, expand the picture uh, beyond, uh, beyond the United States. And so for example, in Philadelphia, I'm, I'm in Baltimore right now, and so Philadelphia is not that far from here. Um, the makeup of Philly um, is such that uh, a significant portion of that community uh, is Black. And those residents are uh, disproportionately essential workers, uh, and they face barriers in terms of taking time off work, finding transportation, um, and the like, uh, to even make uh, and, and, and get um, a vaccine appointment. Um, outside of those barriers, there's also redlining policies that have taken place, which have located distribution centers outside of communities of color in the United States. For example, um, officials in Dallas County uh, had to stop a plan that was uh, aimed at prioritizing COVID-19 vaccine doses for people living in the most vulnerable zip codes after the state of Texas actually threatened to cut off the county's vaccine supply. And what we've seen from the data 
um, from uh, states uh, that track vaccination data by uh, race is that COVID-19 vaccines are primarily going to white people. And that's despite the fact that the pandemic has been ravaging communities of color disproportionately. And so um, a large percentage of white people have received the vaccination uh, about 1.4 times higher than the rate of black people and 1.2 times higher than the rate of Latinx folks uh, in the United States. Um, and uh, if you look at California, where there's a substantial uh, Latinx uh, community, uh, they make up about 40% of the population um, and 60% of the COVID-related deaths, uh, only 29% of vaccines have gone to Latinx uh, people. Similarly, in Washington, D.C., where you have a pretty sizable um, proportion of the population that is Black, um, uh, 46 percent of the population, 71 percent of the deaths um, are um, uh, from Black people dying from, from COVID, and they've only received 43 percent of the vaccinations. And so what we have, um, if I can paint a picture, is, you know, a very high uh, number of people um, in communities of color being um, impacted by COVID-19, but not um, having access to um, vaccinations or, or, or getting vaccinations um, at the same rate that the disease is impacting those communities. Uh, globally, when we think about vaccine redlining, um, what that has meant is that people living in um, countries in the global south are not expected to have significant doses of vaccines administered until as late as 2024 by some estimates. And um, as of June of this year, um, African countries and India had vaccinated less than 3% of their combined populations. And I'm sure you all have been following the news about uh, the ways in which the Delta variant has been ravaging um, people um, in India and, 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 and spreading um, quite, uh, quite scarily to, to, to um, devastating results. Uh, and so some have 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 pointed to uh, the lack of uh, vaccine uh, doses in the global south as a result of limited supply. They will point to a lack of production facilities or logistical impediments, uh, the need for <clears throat> some vaccines to be stored at sub-zero temperatures. Um, uh, some require uh, a the development of cold distribution chain for vaccine administration um, and the like. And um, while these factors exist, I think that it's um, quite easy actually to point um, at sort of the logistical uh, barriers that could be overcome um, because that obscures, I think, what is a larger problem, which is the fact that uh, vaccine nationalism um, and um, international solidarity has been wanting. Um, and so what, what, is, what is, instead of solidarity, we have vaccine nationalism, which is predominated. And so countries have prioritized themselves with bilateral deals and securing vaccines. They've been hoarding supplies to vaccinate their population several times over. Uh, the European Union, for example, has continued to authorize its member states to actually put limits on the exportation of vaccines. Um, some analyses indicate that rich countries are on track to hoard over a billion COVID-19 vaccines. Um, the G7, for example, uh, will have a three billion surplus of vaccines. And so at the same time that you have wealthy countries sort of hoarding vaccines, uh, they've also failed to adequately support and fund uh, global health schemes like COVAX, uh, which is the main initiative that the World Health Organization has uh, come up with to try to provide vaccinations to people in low and middle income countries. And it's seemingly, um, not seemingly, it's, it's, it's unseemly rather, uh, and unjust for wealthy countries to hoard vaccines and, and, and drive up prices on the one hand, which makes it difficult for other countries to acquire vaccines while at the same time promising charitable donations that are uh, insufficient or are not forthcoming. That said, even if uh, the COVAX initiative were fully funded, a philanthropic model that 
relies on the munific munificence of others uh, to donate money or to share their vaccine surpluses is actually fundamentally flawed, given the need for country to, countries to vaccinate entire populations. Um, what we've seen through COVAX is that the amount coming through COVAX is just simply not enough for um, countries to vaccinate their entire populations or, or even to approach herd immunity, which is the goal with vaccinations. Um, by April, COVAX had distributed about 43 million doses of vaccines to 119 countries, which covers just about 0.5% of their combined population of more than 4 billion. Uh, and so COVAX has continued to struggle to meet its vaccine delivery targets. Um, and that uh, scarcity within the COVAX structure um, is compounded by the fact that COVAX depends on extant power relations, which are skewed in the favor of pharmaceutical industry and countries within the global north, which um, is where a lot of the production of vaccine doses is taking place. So I want to introduce the concept of medical neocolonialism at this point, because I think it's instructive here and helps us to understand a bit about what's going on. Um, and so medical neocolonialism is a concept that aptly, I think, characterizes the pattern of extraction of resources from Black and other people of color. Uh, the knowledge is generated from um, research, for example, on um, these populations is taken to develop new treatments and drugs. And then the subjects of that research in their communities generally do not share equitably in the benefits of the new drugs or treatments. And so medical neocolonialism draws on many of the characteristics of historical colonialism in that it's similarly driven by economic dependence, exploitation, and inequality, uh, and treating of communities of color as disposable. And so I want to connect the concept of medical neocolonialism to a case study of um, South Africa, which is one of the hardest uh, hit countries on the African continent. South Africa accounts for more than 35% of the 5.8 million cases um, in Africa's 54 uh, countries, although it's home to only 4% of the population. Um, the average daily death has doubled. Uh, and it received its first round of vaccines in February 2021. Uh, that vaccine was only 22% effective against the beta variant, um, which is predominant within South Africa and um, has not been usable. South Africa obtained um, those vaccines at a cost of 5.25 per dose, um, US dollars, which is more than $2.16 per dose, US dollars, that the European Union um, had negotiated for itself and, and paid the manufacturer AstraZeneca. What is problematic about that arrangement is not only that, uh, you know, the inequities in terms of the, the contractual terms, but South Africans had actually participated in clinical trials for the development of that very same vaccine. Um, and so underneath research principles, they should have been given greater post-trial access and benefit sharing, um, which did not occur. And so what happened is South Africa had to pay more for a drug it ultimately is, is not able to use, um, given the lower efficacy of the vaccine against the variant that is most prevalent in South Africa. Um, and so this uh, vividly, I think, illustrates Paul Farmer's observation about how the fruits of medical and scientific advances can be stopped off for some and denied for others. Um, within that, I also want to um, bring in um, some discussion of the role that the international intellectual property regime is playing in this space, uh, because it's also severely compounding the challenges of equitable vaccine uh, distribution. And so briefly, I will just note that uh, the international intellectual property regime provides a 20 year monopoly for pharmaceuticals until the creation of uh, this regime. Many countries did not even place uh, patent protection on pharmaceuticals. Uh, the trade related aspects of an intellectual property rights agreement or TRIPS as it's called, um, extended US style patent protection for pharmaceuticals uh, globally. Um, within this regime, um, there was the attempt and um, ongoing uh, expansion of patent protection. Uh, the Doha Declaration is something that was passed, um, which says that, okay, well, TRIPS provisions are meant to be compatible with public health. 
um, and to try to create better flexibilities for incentivizing research and development um, in the event of public health emergencies. Um, and so that background is useful for understanding the current um, dispute that's taking place before the World Trade Organization's um, TRIPS Council. And that's the uh, sort of governing body for um, this particular regime. So India and South Africa put forward a waiver proposal um, that argued essentially that COVID-19 presents a time of legal exception and that we need to waive the pharmaceutical protections, uh, patent protections on pharmaceuticals because of the COVID-19 emergency. Uh, in October of 2020, India and South Africa requested uh, that this waiver be implemented um, and that provisions of the trip agreement essentially be waived or, or held in abeyance because of this emergency. Uh, they argued that a waiver is needed to prevent and contain um, and treat COVID-19 given the acute health shortages faced by many countries. In the initial proposal, India and South Africa requested that the waiver should continue for as long as um, it took for a widespread vaccination to be in, in place in most of the world's population. Uh, they've since revised that stance to request, I think, a, a three-year waiver now um, uh, since the revised proposal came in May. But, the, but their joint submission is, is important because it seeks to substantially reshape um, the TRIPS regime by allowing for a deep technology transfer for effective COVID-19 vaccines for therapeutics and diagnostic tests. So it's not just vaccines, it's also the tests, um, and it's also therapeutics, meaning um, oxygen, ventilators, and things uh, like that. Uh, the jump joint submission covers um, not only patents, but also copyright, industrial designs, undisclosed information, trade secrets, um, and the like. And so the idea here is, well, we need this temporary ban to allow multiple actors to start production instead of limiting manufacturing to the small number of current patent holders, which limits access and renders a significant number of people um, disposable because they don't have access to vaccines. Uh, and so this proposal has found uh, significant support within the African group of countries and other countries within the global south and has since been gar garnering more and more co-sponsors. Um, Brazil has since reversed its hardline opposition and is now supportive of the waiver proposal. China has expressed support for the waiver proposal. Uh, recently, the Biden administration indicated that it would also support the waiver proposal, but only for vaccines. Um, not for the other aspects of the proposal, and, and France recently switches to supporting the waiver. Opponents of the uh, proposal include, um, unsurprisingly, the pharmaceutical industry, uh, but a number of uh, wealthy countries like the United Kingdom um, and, and those in the European Union, uh, South Korea, and others. Um, the European Union has uh, put forward some third-way proposal that is supposed to um, be focused more on use, the use of compulsory licenses, uh, but it does not address the concerns put forward by countries supporting the waiver, who frankly have had more experience trying to utilize the compulsory licensing provisions um, within uh, the TRIPS regime, which I can talk about uh, later during, during Q&A. And so what's significant though, is that the countries that oppose the waiver proposal account for a significant percentage of the globally administered uh, COVID-19 vaccines. And um, on their view, intellectual property rights are not a barrier to access as the current system is required to incentivize new inventions. Um, and they maintain that equitable access can be achieved through voluntary licensing and technology transfer arrangements and, and the like. And so I wanted to take that um, <coughs> at face value and, and point to um, one of the main technology transfer, voluntary transfer arrangements that has been set up, which is um, COVID-19 technology access pool, um, which uh, does not look promising uh, to date, um, uh, despite the problems with just relying on um, the largesse of pharma uh, as a public health strategy. Um, there has been no uh, indication that um, any of the major pharmaceutical companies are interested in um, sharing technology through this um, access pool. 
Um, the United Nations created a patent sharing program, uh, the medicines patent pool, um, and it has not been successful in negotiating any deals for drugs through that. Um, the World Health Organization, through this technology access pool, um, has not been able to uh, attract any um, any pharmaceutical companies to, to take part. Um, so Pfizer uh, has, has talked about the technology access pool as quote unquote nonsense. Um, biotech has showed no commitment to this technology access pool. Moderna, no commitment to uh, the technology access pool or sharing IP. AstraZeneca, no commitment to um, this technology access pool and actually openly opposes sharing IP. Novax, no commitment. Uh, to this uh, technology access pool, um, Johnson and Johnson, no commitment to this um, technology access pool, Sanofi, some sort of loose commitment to sharing IP, but no commitment to this technology access pool, Sinovac um, has shared some with Indonesia and Brazilian producers, but no commitment to this um, global technology access pool. Uh, Gamalea, no commitment to this um, technology access pool. So I think it's actually important to take time to name, um, you know, each one of the major uh, vaccine uh, companies and uh, talk about, uh, you know, whether voluntary transfer arrangements are actually a thing that is um, feasible. To date, that has not shown to be the case. Moreover, um, as South Africa put in its initial intervention before the TRIPS Council, the problem with sort of a philanthropic model or voluntary-based model is that it, it is not and cannot buy equality. And so the IP waiver request by South Africa and India um, is an important thing that's been on the Council's agenda for some time. It's going to be uh, discussed again at a meeting that's held in, in July of this year, and it's yet to be determined whether any um, more consensus will be reached um, than they did in past meetings in, in March and in June. Um, what has happened, though, is that um, more countries have continued to indicate support for um, the proposal, at least, or at least some aspects of the proposal. And increasingly, there's been talk of supporting text-based negotiations. What exactly that means is unclear, and how that will um, impact uh, change on the ground is also unclear. Um, recently, Australia and Canada have also, which had previously opposed the waiver, are, are also um, saying they are in favor of supporting text-based negotiations. And the new WTO director, um, General Ngozi Okonjo Uwela, um, has changed from supporting sort of the EU um, so called third way to now uh, saying that uh, you know, all ambassadors need to come to the table to negotiate a waiver text to figure, to figure this out. And so I want to close by um, reflecting on some remarks that um, the director general of the World Health Organization. Uh, said earlier this year, and that um, the world is on the brink of a catastrophic moral failure. Uh, and the price of this failure, he said, will be paid with by the lives and livelihoods of those in the poorest countries in the world. And I want to paraphrase that and to be clear that the price has been and will be borne by the lives of racially subordinated peoples. Uh, if the current course is not corrected, vaccine apartheid will only deepen and the resulting mal distribution will render historically subordinated groups even more uh, disposable. And so I think that uh, irrespective of whether exacerbating racial subjugation was the intention of law and policymakers in uh, the intellectual property regime when structuring legal incentives for research and uh, pharmaceutical innovation is immaterial um, because the impact of the system is one which further entrenches racial subordination. And um, that lack of intentionality does not render uh, that devastating impact any less acute, uh, nor does it alleviate, I think, the obligation of actors to remedy the inequitable uh, racialized disparities that we're seeing with vaccine apartheid um, during COVID-19. And so I think this seminar is an important space for us to remember how diseases and responses to diseases are linked to colonial and ongoing politics of racial exclusion. And it's important that we take an intersectional approach 
in analyzing um, these things because otherwise we may not fully capture how multiple overlapping areas, um, be it race or class, um, gender, sexual orientation, geography, and the like may function to produce heightened subordination. And I think there is a way in which conventional analyses tend to obscure the functioning of race um, and histories of subordination when thinking about um, a vaccine um, access amongst other issues. And so it's important that we critically engage with, um, with this uh, and, and, and not sort of think about uh, a quote unquote market failure um, in a context that disassociates how um, histories of failing to serve um, communities of color uh, and, and, and exploiting communities of color um, in uh, the scientific realm uh, and the dispossession and devaluation of the lives of Black and Indigenous and other people of color um, is playing out um, at the current moment as well. And so thinking about addressing racialized global health inequities and vaccine apartheid will require a significant level of legal reform and restructuring uh, to counteract years of uh, entrenched racial subordination. And it's also important that we be able to name what's happening. Um, and I think that while COVID has um, revived sort of stereotypical colonial imaginations of how diseases sort of trans transfer or, or happen, uh, it's also challenging uh, racialized hierarchies of diseases. And so in, in some sense, it's creating that duality is creating an opportunity to rethink and reshape uh, the relationship between um, race and global health and, and perhaps open uh, new possibilities for thinking about anti-subordination efforts. So I'll stop. Awesome. Thank you so very much. This was an incredibly rich uh, uh, presentation that I think, um, especially your call towards the end, you know, take into account structures uh, of subordination and histories of imperialism and inclusion. I think it's essential both uh, on the topic you were discussing, but I think it could be read as a call more broadly on how to do uh, legal scholarship, right, well beyond uh, the question of vaccines or contagious diseases. Um, on that note, I will actually pass uh, the mic to someone who has been doing uh, exactly that, Wayne, um, who will comment uh, on Matinga's presentation, but also ask her some questions. Uh, Wayne, the floor is yours. Thanks, Dina. And uh, thank you to Masianga for such a, um, yeah, searing critique um, and timely, you know, critique of, uh, yeah, what's going on uh, in terms of the disposability and the discourses surrounding that uh, at a global level uh, with respect to this disease and race. Um, yeah, I thought, you know, there are a number of, you know, really interesting um, uh, comparisons between uh, the discourses of race and the effects on racialized communities, you know, that you've been talking about in the United States and uh, at the domestic level here in the US. So I thought I might, you know, start off just by making a couple of comments uh, about that. And we might have then, you know, a little bit of a chat about, um, you know, what you think possible strategies are or what you're seeing in the US um, and whether they might be uh, also useful here, you know, in Australia. And then, you know, after that, yeah, let's uh, move then to talk a little bit about, um, yeah, the global level. Uh, I'm, I'm really interested too in terms of, again, what you think strategies are both inside and outside uh, legal regimes. Uh, in terms of yeah, addressing some of these problems and the, the points that you've made about trips and the regimes, et cetera, there. So yeah, we'll get onto that as well. But as I said, first of all, I thought I might just make a couple of comments um, in terms of the domestic situation here uh, in Australia and the uh, uh, racialized discourses that we're seeing take place, which I think are really interesting. And um, sometimes along similar lines, sometimes perhaps along slightly different lines um, than we're seeing in the US. And I think that, you know, one particularly interesting aspect of that are some of the discourses surrounding uh, Australian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, 
uh, and the differential effects and discourses surrounding the disease. So, you know, one thing um, that has been very common in public discourse here in Australia, um, yeah, is a notion that Indigenous, we've been very successful um, at protecting, you know, our Indigenous people. Uh, and one of the interesting things here, I think, is the fact that the way that, you know, some governments and some public institutions tend to claim credit for that when uh, in terms of what's actually gone on, and this has been, you know, a real, um, uh, shows the importance, I think, of uh, local control, uh, self-determination, et cetera. It is absolutely clear that the reason why there have been some successes there um, is because of the fact that local communities, uh, Indigenous elders, Indigenous health organisations and Indigenous health groups um, have really taken such a profound lead uh, in terms of educating their communities in ways that, you know, speak to their communities. So again, you know, some of those issues of intersectionality and the importance, you know, of bringing that into our um, debates and our strategies in this area. So, you know, on one level, that's been quite successful, but I found your comments on discourses of vaccine hesitancy really interesting as well, because again, this is becoming a bit of a common theme uh, in what many uh, mainstream media outlets, governments, et cetera, are saying about, you know, Indigenous communities here. Um, and yeah, vaccine hesitancy, which I think doesn't at all take account of some of the factors that, you know, you are highlighting in terms of colonial histories um, and the way in which they can affect things like um, discourse surrounding uh, vaccines, hesitancy, et cetera. So, you know, there's some really interesting stuff going on with our Indigenous communities. Um, apart from that, though, you know, other racialized discourses. So, uh, you know, we've seen here in Australia, and in fact, we're seeing it right now in Sydney. Um, yeah, uh, different discourses and different regulation um, surrounding COVID based upon ethnicities and concepts of race. So last year in Melbourne, um, we saw some uh, lockdown of public housing towers, um, you know, and this, uh, this uh, positioning of ethnic communities as sites of contagion um, and sites of threat um, in terms of leaking out into broader communities. Um, we're seeing similar things right now in terms of Sydney. So we've seen quite different regulation between the west of Sydney, uh, which again uh, is racialized um, and is you know, known for its uh, ethnic minority communities. And again, there are real associations here, as you were talking about in the US, with um, frontline workers uh, who are often uh, you know, from those community groups completely different sorts of regulation in those parts of Sydney from what we're seeing in the wealthier white parts of Sydney. So, you know, uh, different types of lockdown and particularly different types of police regulation. Uh, so, yeah, as I said, you know, I think we're seeing, you know, really interesting racialized aspects of the disease here at the domestic level. So I wondered um, uh, if you might comment a little bit more how, you know, some of the communities of colour um, are attempting to address this in the United States and whether you think there's things that we could uh, learn from that. So thanks for that. Um, I appreciate that. I, th I think that there, there is a way in which um, the use of vaccine hesitancy, which is why I tried not to give it too much space, um, I think obscures a, a history in which much of medical uh, experimentation was done on indigenous and people of color to um, provide, you know, research um, for not those communities, right? For for um, uh, white communities in the U.S. And, and 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 elsewhere. And so that history is hard to sort of run from now uh, mm -hmm. because, in 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 many ways, it informs uh, the response um, to the extent that. Um, what is happening is, is actual vaccine hesitancy, the response to um, 
many uh, who have uh, skepticism about um, vaccines is is that uh, you know we have been generally ex experimented on uh, and used in a way that is not uh, beneficial for us. So where is the care and concern coming from now, right? So that so some some of that um, skepticism is, is is sort of underlying. Um, and what is um, I think more uh, a, a, an issue has been um, just uh, not not enough access within uh, those communities. And so what what has been I think um, a strategy that is helpful um, has been actual um, members and parts of the community talking about uh, you know either the, their work in helping to develop some of the vaccines. Um, for example, um, one of the uh, developers of one of the vaccines is a, is a black female and she's been very visible and, 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 uh, uh, and the like. And then also, um, you know, doctors uh, uh, have from historically subordinated uh, communities have been doing community outreach um, and, and public service announcements and the like such that it doesn't seem uh, solely is that the message is coming from sort of majoritarian uh, uh, sort of white uh, interest. Um, and, and so I think that that has been helpful, um, uh, certainly, um, and has made, um, has, has, has taken some inroads into, to the extent that there is vaccine he hesitancy is, 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 is helping with that. Um, but I think it's, 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 you know, it's too easy to say, oh, well, you know, why are you, uh, why are you just taking the vaccine, right? It's like, well, there, you know, there's all these years of, <laughs> of history of, um, you know, medicine not necessarily being, being used for the advantage of indigenous and, and black and other communities um, that is hard to just sort of undo, right? And so there is hard work that needs to be done um, that uh, the medical establishment, quite frankly, has to do. Um, and that work shouldn't be born um, on communities who have been um, detrimentally impacted in, in, in the past, right? And so what is, what is also, I think, important, um, and, and the, what I didn't have time to mention in um, my uh, remarks today is that, I, you know, I'm not, when I, when I mention this, I'm, people think I'm talking about Tuskegee or something sort of far away. And it's just like, well, no, right? Like as recent as the um, Ebola epidemic, there were um, uh, all types of egregious behavior taking place um, of experimenting uh, drugs that were not um, clinically tested on um, or clinically indicated for uh, treatment of Ebola on uh, those suffering Ebola. Um, that took place in Sierra Leone. Um, you had uh, a number of um, people who um, had donated uh, blood, having their blood being um, taken to um, laboratories without their consent. So anyway, so all of that is to say that there is a very, there is the, the long history, but there's also a recent history in which um, there is ongoing exploitation of people of color, um, which uh, people are not ignorant of, um, and so informs um, their re receptiveness in some sense to, um, to vaccines. And so I think uh, to the extent that, from what I'm, I'm hearing from you is that, to the extent that there has been success is because local actors are taking um, the lead in communities um, I think that that's similar to what's happening here to the extent that we are uh, making progress is because um, community members in the affected populations are, um, you know, having, uh, doing outreach, doing um, information uh, campaigns and the like, and that that is um, going to be a more meaningful thing than having, you know, sort of outsiders to the community um, trying to uh you know preach um messages about you know the importance of, of, of vaccinating absolutely and if i if i may add to to that sorry i just jumped in i was actually reading it uh a couple of days ago that to, to um buttress wayne's point that in the u.s the community with the highest vaccination rates are native americans 
um, and again, the importance of sovereignty and that this has been also beneficial to the local settler communities, that they are giving also out vaccines, not only to um, citizens, to tribes, tribal citizens, but also to local settler uh, communities. Uh, so I think to, to buttress the point of yours, both about local initiative in particular, but also about sovereignty when it comes to Indigenous peoples in particular. Um, I'll stop now and give you back no, the I, I'm glad that you, you interjected because the other point that I wanted to make that I think all often gets lost in this vaccine hesitancy. I mean, a lot of the, you know, it's like, oh, there goes the people of color vaccine hesitant again. But there are a bunch of surveys that indicate um, Quite frankly, that it's, you know, there's a high level of vaccine hesitancy among Republicans, among white Republicans, among evangelicals, among um, uh, groups that do not get centered in the, in the conversation about vaccine hesitancy, which I think is another way of trying to uh, stigmatize um, communities of, of color for, um, you know, and, and make it about a politics of responsibility as opposed to a personal responsibility, as opposed to um, sort of structural barriers to um, to, to gaining access. Um, and so I think it's important to just to bring that uh, into the space. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and yeah, again, you know, uh, the uh, yeah, discourses of vaccine hesitancy, yeah, are, uh, you know, really interesting when they're not understood in terms of those, yeah, uh, histories of colonialism, medical colonialism, uh, and when it comes to Indigenous communities, you know, sovereignty, etc. So, yeah, look, that's really interesting. And I do want to, yeah, leave time for, um, uh, yeah, anything from the audience. Um, but, yeah, I did want to just raise then, um, you know, I was struck, again, you know, uh, in terms of all of the things you were saying, about the international legal regime um, and the, you know, TRIPS uh, and the WTO regimes in particular. Um, and despite the um, attempts by, uh, as you say, uh, India, uh, South Africa, supported by other uh, global South nations to use some of those structures, um, well, well, I suppose in a sense they're forced to use the very structures of the institutions, which at the same moment they are attempting to displace. And I'm wondering about the contradictions there. Um, and I'm wondering about, yeah, whether, uh, you know, we do need to a sense, although it sounds very um, perhaps defeatist, uh, stop seeing these international legal regimes as a solution. Um, I, I don't know about you, Matangai, but I don't think we're going to get much joy out of the TRIPS Council um, or the WTO, um, you know, even despite the growing support, um, you know, from, uh, yeah, Global South and even nations like the US, at least to some extent. Um, so I'm wondering there about the structures of international law um, and, you know, whether you see this as a field in which it is important to continue to fight um, or whether our, um, you know, our uh, efforts are better served perhaps outside some of these regimes in more political and direct global action type ways um, to try and um, uh, counter some of the subordinations that you've been talking about. Sure. I mean, I think that, you know, I, I'm, I'm definitely not the, the cheerleader for the WTO. No, I know. <laughs> by, yeah. by any means or by any stretch of the imagination. Um, what I think uh, is interesting about the, the move of, and the waiver proposal is it's um, sort of turning a mirror onto the inequities inbuilt within that regime, which I think is actually a useful thing to do. Um, and we saw this too with um, the HIV and AIDS pandemic and the ways in which there was global organizing um, by advocacy organizations, uh, you know, people over profits and the like, um, that put pressure on um, the US trade representative and others who were trying to similarly um, uh, uphold patents in the face of, uh, of a pandemic and uh, effectively shamed uh, a number of countries from, uh, you know, challenging um, South Africa and other uh, countries' ability to gain access to 
to medicines. So I think that in, a, in, in some ways we are seeing um, the evolution of that in some sense, because we still have a, a grassroots organizing, uh, civil society organizing around um, quote, quote unquote, the people's vaccine, right? So opening the tech and, and all of that. So we have that mobilization that is taking place. Um, that's uh, taking place sort of outside of the formal channels of the, the TRIPS Council and the like. Um, at the same time, we have members of the WTO taking it to task for essentially um, the provisions not being um, providing any meaningful uh, resolution in this um, pandemic. And I think that the um, there is even 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 the which, which I think is one of the staunchest uh, you know upholders of patents, the U.S. Right? I think even the fact that the U.S. is um, saying, okay, we need to um, rethink this with respect to vaccines. Even that small uh, thing, I think, is meaningful because it opens a door to pushing up on other fronts. So I, I, I think what I would say to that is that it is useful strategically. It is not the only tool that we should be using to try to advance change by any means. Um, and knowing that this is going to be a slow um, process, there has to be uh, things that are taking place outside of the um, trade regime that are going to bring relief uh, to people. Um, but I think that uh, trying to change the, the sort of architecture, the legal architecture, is something that is that something that is meaningful um, and calling attention to the inequities within that um, legal regime is is important work that that needs to be done. But it doesn't and, and it can't stop stop there. Yeah, I often have interesting, you know, discussions with my students about how even if we don't see legal regimes as providing us with very many answers, they are sites that are so important that, yeah, we cannot, um, yeah, abdicate the field, so to speak. You know, we have to continue to fight those battles within those legal regimes yeah. because they are such important sites of power, um, even if they don't always give us the answers that we want. Um, yeah. I, I don't know. Let's let's see if any of the audience, I don't think any po questions have been posted yet, but we really can. We don't have any questions yet, and I think as long as we don't have any questions, I'm very happy for you. We will keep talking. Yeah, yes. but just make sure yeah but just yeah leaving that invite there to the audience if anybody wants to you know post questions you know still uh, uh yeah please feel free um well yeah and 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 picking up on um i i suppose uh you know what dina mentioned in her introduction when i was listening to you and also when i was uh reading your paper in particular matangai um and thinking about the disposability um, and its connections with disease. I couldn't help but, um, uh, yeah, have those associations with HIV historically. Um, uh, you know, uh, both in the United States, in Australia and globally. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I suppose I'm at least at that age where, and having grown up in the late 1970s and 80s um, as um, a teenage gay man and then a young gay man, um, you know, seeing the discourses, um, first of all, in the United States um, and during the Reagan era. Um, and yeah, because of the particular constructions of the communities that were affected by HIV. Um, so again, racialized communities, uh, gay men, uh, sex workers, drug addict, the disposability um, and the way in which that affected the development or the lack of development um, of treatments, um, you know, uh, for the virus. And I remember, you know, really powerful images of, you know, community action within the United States, you know, calling attention to this very fact, um, the disposability and the lack of action that was you know, resulting therefrom. So I think that again, you know, these, um, uh, yeah, the, this theme of disposability uh, uh, and the way that, uh, yes, yeah, certain communities and the impacts of disease 
have those broader effects, I think are really interesting, as well as what I said earlier, you know, in terms of concepts of threat. Um, because, yeah, whilst the same time as, uh, yeah, discourses of disposability are becoming evident on a racial basis, you know, we also see, um, yeah, these very same communities often posed as the threat. Um, so, you know, here in Australia, we have had such racialized discourses, particularly recently about uh, India um, and the Delta variant um, and the threat that this poses globally. And of course, we still see some of these discourses when it comes to HIV and some of the communities I mentioned, the fact that gay men still cannot donate blood. Uh, you know, uh, uh, in so many parts of the world. So, yeah, again, these these um, similarities with uh, other. Yeah, no, I mean, I pandemic. think it's it's it's. Um, thank you for drawing attention to that um, because I think the, there's a way in which uh, the rendering of the communities that are seen as most impacted by the disease also informs what the public response should be, right? What the public health intervention is. Right? And so if we can, and, and, and to the extent that those communities are already marginalized, right? So gay men um, or, or sex workers and the like, um, then there isn't a need to prioritize um, sort of uh, treatment um, and uh, to do uh, mass scale public health um, sort of education and the like, because it only, um, quote unquote, impact these um, communities uh, that are apparently or presumed to be um, not that necessary, right? They're expendable, they're disposable uh, um, to some subsets of society who hold that view. And we've seen this also with, with COVID um, and, 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 and in the ways in which ageism has played a role, right? It's like, oh, and, and remember uh, a, a lot of the rhetoric around, oh, well, it's really only impacting the old people. And so, you know, they've lived. Um, and so since they've lived, it's not something that we need to um, pay too much attention to in terms of um, the importance for um, global health or public health um, and the like. And then certainly in the US, uh, as uh, COVID became marked more and more um, a as a disease of associated with um, people of color, meaning uh, people of color disproportionately impacted by the disease and that became um, more public knowledge, uh, the appetite for sort of general lockdown um, measures um, public health measures um, and the backlash, right? The 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 quite um, vociferous um, uh, backlash by uh, largely white folks storming state capitals and the like, um, who thought that their liberties, uh, you know, shouldn't be um, curtailed because of concern for those who are regarded as disposable, right? It's like they're, they're not the ones that are being the most impacted. And so why should I not be able to, you know, go get a haircut or do whatever um, other uh, things that um, I prioritize uh, in terms of my freedom of movement as, as, as a white person uh, in this space. Um, and so, so the, the ways in which the disposableness of a community that's impacted or disproportionately impacted by a disease um, plays, I think is, is significant because it also impacts what the public uh, sort of appetite or the public response to a given public health intervention uh, might be. And we've certainly saw that with HIV and AIDS and continue to uh, see that with HIV and AIDS and, and similarly have seen that with, with, with COVID-19. Uh, and so, um, at the same time, uh, there's the duality that you mentioned of um, the communities uh, being seen as disposable, but also sort of as sources of threat um, yes. because they're the harbingers of, um, or presumed to be the harbingers of, of, of the disease um, when that is, uh, you know, not, not at all the, the case, but yeah. Yeah, it's fascinating. You know, it still strikes me that, um, yeah, instead of looking at treatment for those communities in, you know, um, uh, particularly struck by HIV, one of the first and most um, uh, 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 
vociferous in a sense public health responses was uh, we have to protect the blood supply. Um, yeah, so it was about, you know, protecting those who did matters, who were not disposable, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, rather than the treatments um, for those who were. So, yeah. yeah, you know, these discourses I find fascinating. Um, yeah, and your paper, of course, your written paper, uh, yeah, uh, you know, talks about some of the uh, HIV um, uh, uh, development treatment regimes within Africa, and again, yeah. um, that aspect of um, medical neo-colonialism, uh, you know, that has been uh, obvious uh, with, uh, yeah, some of the exper experimentation uh, in terms of African communities uh, when it comes to HIV treatments as well. Mm. Thank, Thank you. That was a fantastic conversation. Uh, thank you both. I think uh, we are two minutes past the hour and it's quite late uh, where Machanga is. So mm -hmm. I think I will uh, bring this discussion to a close, even though I think we could have stayed here for hours uh, and have these conversations, especially I think in terms of perhaps what we could also learn from the activism um, in terms of HIV AIDS treatments outside um, the West, right? Because in a sense, it feels like we are having very similar conversations and fights to the fights of the late 1990s and early 2000s, right? And I feel there's so much knowledge within the movements and within activist lawyers that it would be extremely important um, to draw from, especially because I think there is a degree of amnesia that exactly the same arguments that pharmaceutical corporations put forward now, they were exactly the same arguments that they were putting forward in the 90s and they were discredited, right? This yeah. idea that, oh, you know, even if we give them cheap medicine, they will, they yeah, will they move it up yeah. because they don't know how to use them or they, yeah. they don't know how to manufacture them, whereas... Yeah when actually antiretrovirals became available at a more reasonable price, it had a very visible and immediate effect um, yeah. on people's lives in the global South. Yeah. Thank you so very much for your time, for your generosity, for your thoughtfulness. It was a pleasure and a privilege uh, to be part of this discussion. And to everyone who is here, I want to remind you that the next uh, seminar will be in two weeks time. So Friday the 30th, um, where um, Professor Michael Fakri, uh, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food, and Professor at Oregon Law School will be in conversation uh, with our own Associate Professor Imogen Saunders. Uh, thank you both so very much and have a lovely weekend. All right. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. <laughs>